Welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Herring. Today, my guest is Ryan Rickman, Associate Broker with the Real Estate Group. Ryan has been awarded the Circle of Excellence Award for his work in real estate sales each year from 2012 through 2021, and he is part of one of the most successful real estate teams in Southeastern Virginia. Ryan, welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited we get to do this. I, I feel like we never get to actually catch up. And uh, the, these these kind of uh, episodes are also odd ways to catch up with old friends. So I'm really glad you were up for, for doing this. Yeah, I welcome it. I welcome it. Any chance to um any chance to touch base and check in with you is a, is a good opportunity. Uh, well, Ryan, let's start with uh, just a bit of an intro question. Tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into real estate. Honestly, I, I I feel like I've never not been in real estate. Um, I, I come from a long line of folks that have had their fingers in the real estate industry at various levels. My both granddads were builders. My brother's a builder. My mom was a real estate paralegal, owned a title company. Even as a kid, my folks were investors. Um, I was a child when they bought their first duplex. So I've kind of been steeped in real estate. Um and have never really had a time in my life that I recall that there it wasn't at at some level nibbling around the edges. And then, of course, professionally, um, you know, I ended up here and have just loved it. I mean, it's kind of in your it's kind of in your blood, I think, at some point. Oh, fantastic. Well, uh, so wait, were you actively managing properties during college or did this really kind of take off at some point? When did when did this kind of become when did you decide this is what you were going to do career wise? Um, well, you know, honestly, I always assumed that I would personally invest in real estate. I never expected to do it professionally in the capacity that I am now. Um, but strangely, even in, even in high school, my mom will tell the story that I used to get the newspaper and I would go through classified ads and even then look for good deals, which, you know, that sort of thing with, you know, modern technology, Zillow, truly all of the resources we have, I think are very common, but for a, you know, 14 year old, um, you know, 35 years ago, that was probably a little abnormal. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but, but um, I've always assumed that I would end up in real estate at some, in some way, but not professionally. Okay. Oh, that that's fascinating. I, I'm just looking at the list. I wrote down the d kinds of businesses that you worked through. You said builders, construction, title company, and then uh, having your parents had their own duplex. Uh, but that's all rather different than what you do today. Walk us through kind of what what is your role today with the real estate group? Sure, sure. Well, I am a broker here. Um, and to be candid with you, even this came to me not exactly by design, um, but I was a builder as well, and I was I am a contractor and I was doing um, renovations and flips and starting to do some new construction at the time of the Great Recession um, in, you know, 08, 09 time frame. And a lot of things changed at that time. And I had my real estate license um, and just the way that the industry was, the way that the market was, um, it seemed like a good idea to um, at that time to transition from just building and renovating and selling my own product to helping others do similar things. And so um, I am here at the real estate group as, a, as an associate broker now and um, have been helping clients buy and sell real estate for, um, you know, since about 08, 09. Okay. Oh, man. What a fascinating time to kind of get in. So you you got into direct selling and buying a property uh, just as the market took a huge downturn. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, um, you know, it was uh, trial by fire. It was uh, probably not the best time to be doing that. But, you know, as you know, every industry was struggling at that time, um, particularly real estate. That was an unusual recession. M most recessions the real estate industry is the segment of the economy that sort of bolsters everybody. And a lot of people will flock to real estate as a safe haven when other sectors go bad. That recession, the great recession of 08 was led by real estate for a lot of reasons, which we can unpack later if you choose to, but um, it was a tricky time to get into, it was a tricky time to get into real estate as a traditional realtor and broker. Um, 
but we have been we've been very blessed um, to be candid. It's not just me. My wife is an agent as well. And we have a we have a team um, that has, um, you know, we've seen lots of different kinds of markets now. And, um, you know, we've learned to adapt and have have been successful. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, let, let's follow that trail for just a moment. Take us back to uh, 2008 and how real estate contributed to a recession. I think I know I think of um, real estate as sort of a hedge against inflation and kind of a hedge against some of those typical market fluctuations. But uh, 2008 was certainly an odd uh, an odd era. I know uh, I know the phrase subprime mortgage crisis, yeah. but I have trouble articulating that. Walk us through some of how did that recession come about and how does it tie to the real estate market circa 2008 or perhaps before then? Sure. Well, um, the, the short story is um, there was a lot of really, really bad lending practices, some very structural problems that were taking that were going on at that time that have been largely cured now um, through one, a hard lesson that led to better policy. Um, so, you know, at that time, you know, I, I, you've probably heard of things like ninja loans, no income, no job. They'd still give you a loan. I mean, at that time, lenders were willing to give almost anyone that could fog a mirror um, financing to buy homes. And you had people that were, you know, taxi drivers and convenience store clerks that were buying six, seven, eight income properties. Um, and there was absolutely no actual income from this individual that showed them to be good borrowers. And so there was an enormous amount of speculation at that time. Um, there was a lot of other structural things. Um, as you said, um, they were bundling up good loans with bad loans. There was a lot of stuff happening in the secondary mortgage market, which is, you know, sort of a world unto itself that I don't know we want to get into. But there was a lot of things there that, um, you know, they were being bundled up and sold, sold as institutional investments. And they were just very, very bad products. But the buyers of those products, you know, buying 10, 15, 20,000 mortgages thought they were getting good, solid mortgages and they weren't. They were getting these very subpar mortgages. And when those mortgages started to default, you know, um, you had so many institutional investors that had bought these thinking they had class A mortgages and they had class C mortgages. And that led to a um, sort of a domino effect. And, you know, as I said, in most cases, the real estate industry is the safe haven. You know, it's it's the segment of the society that one other sectors spin off of, but two, it's pretty stable. You know, it's sticks and bricks. But when that started happening, not just in the U.S. but all over the globe, you know, it led to a freefall globally that was arrested through you know the feds around the world taking very drastic measures. Um, but, you know, it led us globally to a precipice I don't know that we've seen in the global economy before. Fortunately, um, you know, and this isn't always the case, but I think there were hard lessons learned. The Frank Dodd Act that came a few years later addressed a lot of this. It cleaned up a lot of this faulty lending and bad lending practices. So um, we don't really see, fundamentally, we don't see the things that happened in 08 um, could even structurally occur again. I find that very reassuring. I know I, uh, I, I'm, I'm very much on a, a free market economist and uh, limited government side. But what you're describing sounds like the, uh, the, the same case for good policy, that that yeah. good policy should prevent bad practices from happening and should structurally protect the folks who are getting in there. Let me ask you one follow up question uh, to that. Um, I, my wife and I, have, we got our mortgage five years ago. We refinanced once. But I don't know that I have a good understanding of what makes for a good mortgage versus a bad mortgage. I know we we leaned on our realtor to help us with that process. Uh, Michelle Henderson, I know you know Michelle right. well. Uh, sure. she, she, she directed us right to uh, Town Bank of the Carolinas that helped us go through that process. Yeah. Um, and and I, I suspect most people are kind of in that boat where they they're familiar with mortgages from purchasing homes, but unless they're in the industry, they probably don't have the ability to evaluate what makes somebody a, a good or a bad mortgage. So walk us yeah. through some of how you would evaluate those, those different kinds of loans. Sure. Well, from a consumer perspective, um, you know, a lot of it is just the terms of a loan, um, finding a, a trusted lender, often a local lender. You know, I, I, I tend to prefer, not always, but I tend to prefer 
local lending, local underwriting. So if you're a consumer, you know, having somebody right there, you know, in town that knows your market, knows your area, um, making decisions can be very helpful. So from the consumer side, you know, you just want to look for good terms, a good rate, um, you know, reasonable fees. Every bank needs to make money, um, but make sure that the fees that they're charging are reasonable. Um, and, you know, I think that a savvy consumer, you know, I usually tell my clients, you know, uh, at least in our market in Hampton Roads, I think the average sale price is a little over 300000 That's a That's a big deal. You know, we, we do these deals a lot, so they feel commonplace, but, you know, I, it's nothing to have a half million dollar deal um, now. So it's worth talking to a few lenders and asking about their terms. And, and at some level, as long as their terms are competitive, do you click with them? You know, what's your gut say? Is that somebody that you that you feel comfortable doing a business with? So from the consumer side, those are all good practices. Um, as far as good loan, bad loan, you know, there's a whole nother sector, as I said, the secondary market where, you know, big institutional investors will bundle up 20 or 30,000 of these loans and sell them to institutional investors on the backside. Doesn't affect the consumer much, but as it pertains to 08, like we were saying a few minutes ago, that's what really caused the big problem is there are there are good loans from their perspective, which are probably people like you that have good income and have good credit. And, you know, they're top flight borrowers that uh, a lender or an investor would reasonably expect they're going to pay this back. I can count on the terms of this loan being fulfilled. Then there's B or C or D class loans that are folks that are have much lower credit and you know, basically their qualification is much worse. And so the risk of them not performing on the terms is lower. And so in the secondary market, those are less valuable um, in some sense because they're a, a higher risk like any, in, like any investment. So again, for most consumers though, you know, just interviewing a number of lenders, asking those hard questions, making sure that the terms are good. Again, I, have a, I tend to have a preference for local lending, local underwriting, local decision-making. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And I was thinking with this week's news about uh, President Biden's program to forgive loans, uh, college loan debt to a certain amount. I think it's really interesting that the most valuable loans are the ones that have the highest likelihood of being repaid. Uh, and just there, there is something about this whole right. debt situation that does depend on people actually fulfilling their promise to pay yeah. this back with some agreed upon amount of interest. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of moral hazard in situations like this. And back to 08, not to keep harping on it, but there's a lot of bailouts. And again, mm -hmm. that creates moral hazard where, you know, if an individual or an entity or a corporation thinks well, I can make bad decisions, I can take risks because someone's going to backstop this. It really change, changes natural human behavior in a free and fair free market. Um, so these things need those types of things from a policy perspective, not to get us too far afield, need to be handled with great care, in my opinion. Uh, I definitely agree. I found myself thinking today or imagining myself back being 18, thinking about college, thinking about, OK, if I, I would have made very different choices if I thought it is highly likely that someone is just going to forgive this debt. And yeah. that would be a yeah. very different set of decisions I would make. And they're, right. I, I like that moral hazard because it, it seems to me that it's a, it's a very dangerous position for us to be in to uh, encourage. And I, I don't mean to say that the Biden administration is trying to do this, but I think it's the direct result of that policy to encourage people taking out loans that they never intend to repay. Right. I mean, that's just sure. a very dangerous position for us to be in. Because at least certainly in this case, it puts a it puts the the cost for that directly on the consum on the taxpayer. I mean that, that money is being collected. Um, well, let, let's get back to uh, real estate and maybe more into the present. Um, Ryan, I want to ask you a little bit about your email signature because uh, your email signature lists all of these awards that you've won. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about what it takes to be a successful real estate broker. Uh, I'm particularly interested in how how important is it that you understand your customer and what your customers are really looking for? Does that play a role in being a successful real estate broker? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I often joke that I've never actually, you know, let's just take a buyer, for instance. I've never actually sold a house to a buyer. Um, in my view, what I do is I help my clients after I've, you know, after I've interviewed them and we've counseled together and I know, you know, 
exactly what they and their family need for this season of their life. I simply help them find that product. I don't sell them anything. I just help connect them. And then, you know, of course, the purchasing process for, as I said, sometimes a half million dollar deal or more can be quite um can be riddled with problems and pitfalls. And so, you know, I, I simply help them find the house that works for them in their season of life. So knowing them, knowing their needs, again, being very intimately involved with, um, you know, what their priorities are. And frankly, in many ways, having done this for a while, um, helping, helping them identify the things, you know, very often I have clients that say, well, I, you know, this, when I buy a house, this is a must have, this is a maybe, and as we work through this, it evolves. And those criteria often change a lot because what's right in theory is sometimes wrong in practice. So we work through those things. I help them find a house. I help them negotiate it. You know, I sort of tell them, you know, this process is it's a minefield and there's lots of things that can go wrong. I've done this. So you step where I step and we'll get through this. OK, so from our buyer perspective, it's very important to know exactly, you know, exactly what their real needs are. From a seller's perspective, when I'm representing a seller and helping them sell the house, um, getting to know to getting to know their property is very important. As important as getting to know them, because we really want to find who is the market for this property. You know, the buyer for a condo at the beach is going to be a very different buyer than a three-acre parcel in you know in a rural area. So we, I really want to get familiar with the property. And then obviously, you know, we'll want to know what the goals of the client are. You know, I have some clients that they're, you know, they're kind of like, look, I, I just need, I need this to be fast. I need it to be clean. So we'll price it accordingly so that they get their unique goals. I have some folks that say, hey, I need to squeeze every dime out of this. So perhaps we spend more time, you know, fixing it up, getting it market ready, you know, removing objections before we go on the market and we price it, you know, accordingly in that case. So with the seller, a lot of times it's as much getting to know the property and the market for that unique property and lifestyle, because every property has a slightly different lifestyle and figuring out who we're marketing to. Could you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by lifestyle, the property? I mean, is that sort of like, well, yeah, just what, what, what do you mean by that? Sure. So I'll give you an example from just last week. I had a client who was, they want acreage. Um, they're moving from the city and they want acreage and they found a property that was a 36 acre former equestrian estate. And it's a lovely parcel, but it is, has a number of outbuildings and um, it's got, it's in a very dilapidated condition. So, you know, I explained to them that even if they could purchase it and it, you know, a property like that in our area is going to be pricey. And even if they could afford to renovate and get it up to snuff, you know, I explained to them that, just keeping it there, just maintaining it with that many stables and that many outbuildings is going to require a crew of people. I mean, that would be very hard for someone to do on their own is just to maintain it. That's going to be a lifestyle property. So that's kind of an extreme example. But, you know, properties come with a lifestyle. So, for instance, if you're at a place where you want to travel, um, you know, I'm probably going to say, hey, well, let's talk about a condo. You know, you get a condo, you can lock the door and leave for months. Someone else is taking care of the grass and the roof and all of those things. So it really is the case then that you're not just a student of the market and of real estate and of like interest rates and stuff. You're, you're also a student of human nature to be able to figure out what is it this client really needs in, in that situation and what will what is the thing that will meet their needs? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that's necessarily unique to the real estate industry, but, you know, there's. You know, there's generally five or six major life stressors that everyone agrees upon, you know, a birth, a death, a job change, a divorce, a marriage, you know, mm -hmm. so there's there's this handle, there's this bundle, a small bundle of things that are major life stressors. And so what I find is that I often get clients that are not only dealing with, you know, the major stress of a move and a transition and a purchase or a sale, but it's almost always accompanied by one of those other major life stressors. So learning how to, so often you get people, you know, sometimes you get people at their best in those circumstances. Very often you get people at their worst because they're totally stressed and, you know, their life is up in the air. So learning how to navigate that diplomatically and cautiously, you know, we often joke that, you know, you get your real estate license so that you can be a psychologist. 
it's funny because it's a joke, but jokes are only funny because there's an element of truth to it. No, I, I, I get that. I, I tell my boss for, rather frequently that uh, I, I did a Master's of Divinity. I thought I was heading into seminary. I had no idea I was preparing to be able to have conversations with students at all kinds of moments of crisis. <laughs> but just like I had no idea until I got into the school leadership side of things. Just right. how, many, how much families tend to lean on school leadership yeah. folks for help with those, those exact situations you mentioned, divorce, uh, de uh, usually divorce and death are the two big ones that we tend sure. to see. Students are kind of affected by something in their family and we have to kind of help them figure out how do you, what does normal look like for you and how do we get closer to that than we are today? Right. And no idea those counseling classes were gonna, gonna come in. <laughs> right. So, um, well, um, let me ask you something different then. Uh, I, I love the TV show, The Office. It's it's one of my all-time favorites. There's a scene there where uh, Dwight has had a really good bumper crop of beats one year, and he's trying to figure out how to invest his money. And he talks with uh, Joe, the, the current owner of Dunder Mifflin, and uh, she tells him that if he doesn't invest in real estate, he's a dummy. Don't be a dummy. Invest in real estate. It's very direct. Uh, and Dwight ends up buying the the office building that they they work in and uh, sticking kind of, I guess, with some of your advice and uh, staying local with his property there, uh, at least in that sense. But um, why was investing in real estate kind of good advice? Why? Why? What is it about real estate that makes it almost consistently a good investment? Yeah. Um, well, that's a great question. And I will say, you know, there's a couple of things going on here. Some are very tangible, some are less tangible. But if you look at the sweep of human history, you know, there's only a few things that have almost always worked. Certainly, you can never say always because the exception proves the rule. But, you know, precious metals have almost always been a store of value that has been a safe bet and, you know, has has been a safe way to hold your value to you know, place your money and your earnings and your wealth. Um, real estate, aside from precious metals, is probably one of the only other things that has served in that capacity. Some might say over the last millennia, um, you know, works of art, you know, fine art, things like that, have been a good store of value. But, but real estate, again, if you if you just look at the sweep of human history, it's almost always. Um, it's almost always been effective in maintaining value and growing wealth. So just the preponderance of evidence that we have is overwhelming that real estate has been good. In the more near term, um, with the exception of, you know, 2008, which we talked about a little bit, um, even in American culture, real estate has proven probably the safest investment that you can have. And so so that's kind of, you know, historically, it's hard to argue with those facts. I mean, but I will say at a, at a less tangible level, a sort of a visceral level, I think that there's humans in some way are connected to land. Humans have always wanted their own land, their own piece of dirt, whether it was a farm hundreds or thousands of years ago, or whether it's your townhouse today, there's something about being connected to the land that just resonates at a visceral level. Again, hard to put your finger on it, hard to explain it, but it's very real nonetheless. So, you know, I think that, I think that for, and the simple fact is, um, and I guess at a, a real fundamental level, when it comes to a house, particularly, you know, having, that's a commodity that every human needs. I mean, we have a very primal need for shelter. Um, so there's almost no commodities, you know, that's in a very small bundle of commodities, I should say that every human needs at some level. So the demand should always be there. Unlike other industries that have, you know, have come and gone over the centuries, you know, we don't have too many horses and carriages anymore because, <laughs> you know, it was creatively destroyed when something better came along that will never happen with housing. Everyone will always need shelter. That's really interesting. I, I had not really thought about the, I mean, that, that primal connection piece makes sense. The stable source of value, the idea that um, this is a demand that will never be completely satisfied. So it's, there's right. always an increasing market. 
Um, I want to kind of go back to that humans are connected to land idea for a second. That's that that intrigues me. I mean, I think there's there's such a focus on that throughout scripture, throughout the wider tradition. Um, there's a sense of immigrants who are always looking for a home and stability. Yeah. And then the ability to then pass that land on intergenerationally and to build on that kind of wealth over time. Uh, I don't know. It's got there, there's uh, the Kentucky poet uh, Wendell Berry has a lot of interesting thoughts about uh, this human connection for land. And there's something about our, our typical urban patterns that makes it easy to be a perpetual renter uh, to some extent, but then never get to that spot. Does right. does actually owning land or or a home does it do you think it actually changes the way people live and kind of their habits yeah. of life? Undoubtedly. In fact, I'll give you an example that that I think exemplifies that reality. Um, when you have a condominium community, um, typically, typically, um, and I won't get into the the minutia and the weeds; it's too granular. But typically, what happens is when the owner occupied to renter ratio in a condo community drops below 50%, lenders will no longer lend money for you to purchase in that community. And it's because it is understood that tenants do not take care of the property in the same way. They don't have any pride of ownership because there is no pride of ownership. And all of these things fundamentally affect the soundness of that community. And so they won't even lend on those properties when it's when there is a greater proportion of renters to owners. So, I mean, you know, that that's all borne out in very basic um, lending guidelines because they know that's the fact, you know, the simple, and I tell clients this all the time that have a house and they're going to put it in property management. I say, even if you find the very best tenant and you find great people and they are good people and they are good tenants, they'll never take care of your house like you will, because at a very elemental level, um, they're not vested the way you are. It's just not, it's just not theirs. I mean, nobody drives a rental car the same way drive, they drive their car. <laughs> There's something about being vested. And even more so, as I said, with a commodity like housing, because it's not just a, an object. It's, you know, it's how you, how you stay alive. It's how you're out of the rain and out of the snow and cool in the summer and warm in the winter, which again, connects with us, I think in a, in a, a you know, a, a very primal way. I mean, a very, a very deep way. I think there's a lot to that. That, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Um, what do you make of companies? Uh, the one that I see in my neighborhood is Open Door. That in, uh, I think Zillow tried to get in on this for a little bit, but uh, companies that have bought up houses uh, in residential neighborhoods and are then either the companies are now selling those at a marked up price or are turning around and becoming kind of massive rental companies. What effect does that have on either the housing market in general or on that uh, sort of owner occupied rental space kind of consideration? Yeah, well, it has a significant impact um, on the market. It is, you know, when institutional investors are buying up residential properties and they're renting them, then obviously that takes houses that that takes houses out of the market for actual owners to buy and purchase. So that drives up, you know, that that affects the supply and demand ratios. Um, to be honest with you, and again, I like you, I tend to be a very hands off, um, you know, laissez faire free market kind of guy. Um, I think that the free market will naturally balance itself um, given the opportunity. I think my caveat to that is, especially in a culture like ours, when economies and culture and transportation and communication move so blazing fast, sometimes mm. it moves so fast, the damage is done before the broader free market could realize it's even happening. So there... To put a finer point on that, there are policymakers right now in states throughout the country who are recognizing the problem of these big institutional investors buying up these residential properties, and they're starting to get um, that we're starting to get legislative pushback against that. Um, mm -hmm. Again, in my perfect world, the free market would just sort it out. But again, when you have these companies that are worth trillions. They have such an outsized effect on the market and they can move so rapidly. The market in some cases can't keep up, can't adjust in a normal fashion. 
No. Oh, it makes sense. I, I think uh, one of my favorites, uh, free market thinkers, a guy named Friedrich Hayek, he talks about uh, the, the right role of policy is analogous to a referee at a soccer game where a, a good referee is just setting the rules and enforcing them. It's not overly interventionist. Those right. are really boring games to watch. Right. But yeah. people get hurt at games where the referee is taking a nap. Right, <laughs> and, right. And that's great. Playing where they never should, or the uh, 26-year-old who is playing on a high school team <laughs> is suddenly just running roughshod over everybody. Right. Uh, you need a good referee, and the, the kind of policymaking you're describing seems to me to at least recognize there is a really big difference between an individual buyer who maybe could make an offer at 325 and put down 6% in cash or something versus a company that can come in and offer $410,000 in cash. That's a, that, that the, the average American can't compete yeah. with that kind of. That One has kind to of ask, market. is that really even the free market in a case like that? When you have institutional investors that have, you know, that have budgets larger than most second world countries. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh, that's crazy. Well, let's shift to a different area. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on our current inflationary economy. I, 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 I'm a, I don't think this is going to be transitory in any way, uh, but we're, we're now looking at either 9 to 18% inflation, depending on what your benchmark year is that you measure that against. Uh, how has that inflationary economy and the recent moves by the Federal Reserve to try and tame inflation, how has that affected the real estate market? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody that's been awake for the last two years has not recognized that there's been a great deal of price inflation in real estate. Um, we've had an enormous amount of price inflation. Um, a lot of people, and I understand the parallels, I believe that it is similar to, you know, 06, 07, 08, just before the bottom fell out. Again, for fundamental structural reasons, and also for demographic reasons, I do not believe that that's the case. I don't think we're about to see a big the bottom drop out of real estate. Um, but obviously, inflation has crept into every sector, including including real estate. Um, and as and in order to avoid hyperinflation, and again, I'm no economist, um, so I'll try and just relate this to the real estate sector as much as possible. But you know, in fact, today, Jerome Powell, the Fed head, the chair of the Fed is going to be making an announcement and uh, about rate increases that'll go into effect next month, um, or at least hinting at what their thinking is. Um, the markets right now are expecting probably a 50 to 75 basis point increase. We've already had some big increases. Um, you know, six months ago, you could get a, a mortgage at three and a half percent. And right now we're probably around five and a half percent. Um, that's a lot in a very short amount of time. But what's happening is they need to they need to dampen the economy. And I don't want to unpack all of that stuff. But, you know, we've had a lot of structural things where, you know, for instance, there's just been not enough supply in the in the real estate industry. That's driving a lot of the of the um, price increases. You know, uh, if you look demographically, if you look at the U.S., we've had a couple of great big demographic bubbles that have worked their way through the American timeline. There were the boomers. And they work their way through the American timeline. They're obviously older now. Uh, many of them are downsizing and at a different season in life. And our economy, honestly, just tailored to them as they work their way through the economy. The millennials are the same. It's an enormous demo in our economy working its way through our American timeline. And what happened was a couple of years ago, you know, the millennials were kind of late to launch. A lot of them were doing, they were renting, they were staying home, they were doing other things. But it seems like you know, about two years ago, every millennial decided we need a house and we need it right now. And so we had this huge demand for properties because this segment of the demography suddenly wanted them. We were already a little low on supply before that. That's coupled with, so that's the demand side. The supply side is, um, we've known since 08 when the bottom fell out that our, our country's builders were underbuilding demand by at least a little bit. And, you know, you can't make somebody build a home if they don't want to, but they got really stung during the Great Recession. Most, many of our builders, I think we lost a third of our nation's builders, um, didn't even come back. So they're very cautious. I get it. They were imprinted deeply by that event. So they've been underbuilding demand. 
They've been doing less than economists believe we needed in the supply of new housing units. So we had a shortage of, we have a, a decade long shortage of building and then a huge demand for homes. That's what's driven most of the price increases in the real estate industry. Other sectors, there's other things going on, you know, not to unpack this in just an economic sense, but, you know, the simple fact is the COVID response, right or wrong, you know, trillions of dollars were released into the economy. And so you had a lot more dollars chasing the same number of goods. And in some cases, because of supply chain shortages and, you know, COVID strictures, even fewer goods. So that's driven a lot of it in other sectors. The price inflation in real estate, however, in my opinion, has been largely, a, has been not entirely, but largely a result of these demographic and structural things in our, in our country. Huge number of buyers that needed, that just wanted homes suddenly, and there just weren't enough for them. And there, to be candid, there probably won't be enough homes in the United States to truly satisfy demand for a few more years. We're still behind schedule. So you don't see then there's gonna, there there might be I mean I know in our area in the, the Raleigh Durham area uh, it seems like the housing market has slowed a little bit in the sense that uh, my monthly Zillow report has stopped projecting that my house will increase by twenty percent in a year <laughs> I think the most right. recent number was three percent it seems like we're we're now it's not going down but it's a lot more stable yeah. uh, than it was previously predicted but uh, but you don't see that that. So as long as the supply is relatively low and there is increasing demand, we'll continue to see growth in the in the yeah. value of existing homes. And that's and my expectation. Demand. Okay. Yeah, you know, the last couple of years, you know, we've seen this stratos stratospheric increase, 12, 13, 14 percent. What I think is going to happen is that won't persist, but I think we'll kind of bend into a normal three percent, four percent. You know, it may flatten. You know, maybe we'll lose a point, a percent or two. But I, we're not going to I don't believe we're going to see something like, you know, 09, 10, 11, where the bottom fell out. I think that we'll kind of will bend into a normal curve, maybe flatten for a bit. But I don't see a I don't see a catastrophic problem in real estate. OK, well, that's that's encouraging. Um, Brian, let me ask you about the kind of a different area. We've been talking about kind of the market. We've talked a little bit about business. Um, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about virtue, because uh, in part because the. Uh, the school I teach at, my turn to show a poster in the corner, <laughs> uh, that new poster behind us is our uh, Thales Outcomes. Uh, one of the things that we're always interested in helping students discover is the importance of virtuous leadership. Uh, and it's something that uh, we, I have at my current school, I have a lot of students who they believe they were put on this earth to make lots of money. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to temper some of that. We, we do still think that uh, the love of money is a root of lots of evils, but we also want them to to flourish and to do well in, in their lives. Uh, we think as a school that being virtuous human beings is a big part of that. Um, do you see virtue as part of your business success, as part of your real estate career, or are those really two separate things? No, I mean, I, I'll be candid with you. Um, I think that's the most critical thing in our in, in our business model. Um, and I would, what success we've had, I would chalk up to that. Um, and, you know, I, again, I don't want to stray too far afield and over spiritualize this, but I'll be candid with you. Um, you know, in the words of Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I will tell you, um, I think that there have been times in my career when I was a younger man and, and you know, perhaps I, I engaged in business practices that were, you know, too sharp and, you know, I, I strayed more than I should have from just a simple obedience to character issues and things like that. And, you know, God used those times to beat me up a little bit and remind me how critical it is. And, you know, it makes me think of some. So so virtue in business is the hallmark of what we do now. And I truly believe that it is the reason for our success. Um, and that was bolstered recently. We were um, at a conference recently and it was a um, it was a college fair. And our daughter is, you know, approaching the age we're going to have to have these conversations. And we didn't even know where to begin. So we went to this college fair and one of the speakers there was from um, was saying they were from a tech company, if I recall correctly. And they were saying that they said, you know, what we really want to hire are, you know, hard workers that can get along with others. And, you know, they 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 want to be part of the team and they understand that, um, you know, that 
the success of the whole, that they benefit from the success of the whole. And we want people that we can rely on. And what he didn't realize is, and he said, you know, we'll bring these people in and train them ourselves. What he didn't realize, I think he was saying is that he wants someone that espouses all of those traditional biblical character traits. He wants, you know, the people that our grandmother, you know, taught us to be, you know, those old time values. And, you know, this big corporate, he was a, a tech corporate guy. Um, and that's exactly what he was asking for. And it, it's honestly in short supply right now. Um, you know, I think that if you, I think that all that, I think all you need to do to be successful is learn what the Bible says about success. And I always, I always say this to my daughter and to youth. I said, the first thing you need to do is frankly define success. Because I think a lot of people just adopt the notion that success is making a lot of money and having a great car and a big house. And maybe, you know, maybe if you've thoughtfully and intentionally thought this through, maybe that's your definition of success. I think that that would lead to a very um, unfulfilling life. There's a lot more that makes you a successful person and a, have a successful life than just those things. And I think being intentional about how you define success. So does success include having a vibrant faith life and a vibrant family life. To me, they do. And all of those things comport with what I've frankly learned through my faith. Um, if you read John Maxwell and other people much smarter than me, to be candid with you, Judeo-Christian values, traditional Judeo-Christian teaching really spells out what it takes to have a successful life. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really try to, we really try to, to balance our business. No, we try to root our business in that entirely. And to be honest with you, as I've gotten older, it's probably gotten a little bit easier. But, you know, I, I really try to live a life where I say, you know, this my business is entirely God's and I'm going to live it in a way that honors him. And if he chooses to take it from me, um, then that's his choice. And what he has chosen to do thus far is to honor that decision. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, as you were describing, I remind me of a previous guest in uh, season three, a guy named Scott Yenner, who talked about one of the biggest things he thinks our society could do as a whole is recover what he calls old wisdom. Uh, and it's exactly what you're describing. It's the uh, a lot of those principles are rooted in scripture. An awful lot of them are the very thing that grandma might not know why on earth she might not be able to explain to you why you should be honest. But she knows that you should be honest and explain whether or not you snuck food before dinner or right. not. And that kind, those kinds of things, the the just the ingraining of honesty, yeah. of integrity, they go so far. It seems to me in in uh, carrying us through through life. They're they're vital. Yeah, um, I heard somebody say recently that the world is full of smart people, but there's very few wise people anymore. We need a lot more wise people. That's a that is a true saying, uh, Ryan. What if if uh, I, I know at least one? I have uh, I have a. My dad and one brother have gotten their real estate license. Uh, I've got another family member who's looking to maybe get into real estate. I'm sure there are hopefully some listeners who are thinking, oh, real estate. I, I'd love to uh, know more about that. Uh, what advice would you give to somebody who is looking to get into the real estate field today? Um, well, first of all, I love it. It's a wonderful it's a wonderful industry and it's a lot of fun. Um, I will say, like, you know, when you do it professionally, you know, this is why they pay you to do it um, if they, you know, because it's work. You know, if it, if it wasn't hard, if there weren't downsides, it it would be considered play, not work. So so there's always in any industry, there's, you know, there's some some downsides and there's some tough stuff. But it's a great industry to be a part of, um, partly because it offers so many different avenues. You know, there's there, you know, I have friends and colleagues who are lenders. Um, I have lots of realtors who, uh, you know, have wonderful careers. Um, so, you know, and then of course, you know, there's contractors, there's so many, so many segments of the real estate industry that isn't just the realtor, but from my, you know, my little vantage point as a realtor, um, you know, one thing I would say um, that I, to anybody that's interested in doing this is um, it's important to start out with the long view in mind. I think a lot of people get into real estate and I understand that, you know, they want to improve their lot in life. They want their own business. Those are all great things. But um, like any small business, it's something that needs to be grown thoughtfully and cautiously. And it takes time to grow it properly. Um, I think a lot of agents are way too transactional. Um, they, they don't have a deep pipeline. They haven't been, you know, working hard to, 
cultivate next year's business and the year after that and building those relationships. So as soon as they finish one closing and get a paycheck, they're already panicked to get the next one. And the problem with that, and there's a reason for me saying that the problem with that transactional mindset is that when you're always strapped for cash and you're always worried about where your next paycheck is going to come from, because real estate's hundred percent commission, it can at times pressure you to do things that aren't virtuous things that you might not have done otherwise, but because you're so under pressure, um, you know, you might take, you might take risks. You might make decisions that, you know, you maybe shouldn't that are, you know, maybe not quite the moral angle that you should, you should take. So having the long view and not being transactional is probably the most important thing that I would suggest for somebody getting in the business. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that. Uh, I think it's that, and those are honestly, those sounds like great principles for anybody who's trying to kind of get into a, uh, their own, uh, either their angle on a team or their own independent small business. Yeah. Um, Ryan, just in case any of our listeners live in the Hampton Roads area and are in the market to buy or sell real estate, uh, what's the best way for them to reach out to you and your team? Well, I think if you Google Ryan Rickman, you'll find me all over the internet. I'm easy to find that way. Um, always, my, my phone is always open. That number is 757-469-3444. You can go to uh, www.rickmanandassociates.com um, and find all about us and reach us that way as well. And we'd, we'd welcome and be privileged to help anybody that um, needs help buying or selling in Hampton Roads. Fantastic. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us here on the Optimistic Curmudgeon. It's been a great conversation. It's been a lot of fun. And thank you listeners for joining us today for this episode of the Optimistic Curmudgeon. My guest this episode has been Ryan Rickman, associate broker with The Real Estate Group. If you like this episode, please leave us a five-star review and share it with your friends. Until next time, seek the good, discover the true, and love the beautiful. You've been listening to another episode of The Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Herring. The Optimistic Curmudgeon is a project of Thales Press. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star review and share it with your friends. You can find us on three major social media platforms. Search for The Optimistic Curmudgeon on Facebook and LinkedIn, and find us on Twitter at the handle at the Optimistic C3. This episode was edited and produced by Madison K, audio engineer for The Optimistic Curmudgeon. Until next time, seek the good, pursue the true, and love the beautiful.